dental councils take a very dim view of dishonesty and it can be very hard to keep your registration with the dental council if you have been dishonest with the patient or their parents. Hello, you're listening to the Dental Protection Podcast and this is the case file series where we're looking at diagnostic errors which are often the drivers for the cases and the claims that we deal with for members. And this is the second in the series looking at common dental legal issues arising from the diagnostic errors when providing routine dental care. My name is Dr James Foster. I'm the Deputy Dental Director and Dental lead for Australia and Asia. My own background is from general practice and as a trainer for younger colleagues working in Newcastle Dental Hospital and I joined Dental Protection full-time in 2008. I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague Jim Lafferty who is still part-time in general dental practice. Recently enjoyed his 30-year reunion from his graduation at University of Birmingham and he's been a dental legal consultant with dental protection since 2016. Jim has sat on the UK's General Dental Council for two periods of office and has had senior roles with the British Dental Association, including periods as chair of the UK Council, English Council and Young Dentist Committee. Jim works with Dr Lou Eggleton and myself in the privileged position of handling cases for colleagues in Asia. However, in our belief that prevention is better than the cure, Jim, Lou and I putting these events together as well as our webinars and our publications to try and help inform colleagues and help reduce their risk and minimize the chance of things happening to develop into cases. Hi James, hi everybody. So how can we ensure a comprehensive approach to diagnosis during routine care of our patient base and avoid the associated dental legal pitfalls from common omissions? Now Jim as I've said you're still in practice two days a week. You'll have a cohort of patients attending regularly for routine care. So I think you're well placed to share experience. So should we start with the most common, you know, what what perhaps is the most commonly missed disease and why is that? Well, I would say that most common things occur commonly. And the most common one that occurs is dental decay. So missing dental decay, either from not analysing x-rays properly or an inadequate examination can give rise to quite a few uh, cases at dental protection because invariably that decay will develop and the solution to that is going to be more costly than it would have been had it been detected early enough. So other areas we may put um, under the title of routine care, Jim, may include the failure of restorations, perhaps the diagnosis of fractured teeth. And in monitoring our patients and families, perhaps the development and decay in wisdom teeth and orthodontic assessment as they progress through, which may involve referrals that we actually receive and send out ourselves. So looking at some of those then, in relation to the the, the failure of restorations, when we are looking at routine care, what are the aspects that we need to be aware of when we're monitoring somebody who has a fairly heavily restored mouth? So we're not mind readers, we can't see the future. And we cannot predict when a restoration is going to fail. And we can do uh, a very, very thorough examination. You could do every special test under the sun. And the next week, a patient can lose a filling. Um, You know, that's that's life. That's nature. That's the the nature of the materials that we work with day in, day out. It's the way that we let the patient know that they've got some aging restorations and the way that you conclude that examination is probably going to determine whether or not a quick failure you know soon after a checkup um, is going to come back and haunt you if you say to a patient for example i can see you've got a fair bit of old dentistry in there at the minute i can't see anything that needs replacing um, but you never know then that patient is forewarned that there is the potential for stuff to you know to fail spontaneously and we see cases similar in a similar vein arising from maybe the the diagnosis of a fractured tooth or a fracture not being identified which then develops further and an angry patient comes back banging on the door saying why didn't you spot that yeah i mean it it is notoriously difficult to diagnose fractures in teeth and or restorations 
I had a patient in two weeks ago. They came in with a slightly mobile lower premolar. I could not identify what it was. I did all the special tests that I could, including an appropriate periabigal radiograph, and I even got all of the bone around the uh, the apex so that I could, you know, see it very very well. And I did warn the patient there was a possibility that there may be a fracture, um, and that turned out to be really really useful because the gentleman was off on his holiday two days into his holiday all of the crown and two or three millimeters of root fractured off completely um, and he had pain on his holiday and he came back um, the day after his, his holiday he was knocking on the door wanting an appointment um, and he he said you did warn me there might be a fracture in there um, and he had a, yes of course he had a little moan about being in pain while he was on holiday and the fact that you know potentially it could have been um, identify, but in reality, the only way I could have identified that would have been to shear the tooth off, which you know it turned out to be a surgical extraction. You know, raised the flap, um, removed bone to get this uh, the root out. I don't think he wanted that two days before he went on holiday. Yeah, and it's interesting. We do see uh, claims coming back following holidays uh, for for compensation, saying the holiday's been ruined, and that simple conversation with the patient to set expectations set realities is important because as we know things don't go to plan errors occur or problems occur that we can't foresee and that's why the relationship with the patient is so important isn't it Jim in terms of you know Bunting's work about predisposing and precipitating factors and about building the goodwill Uh, absolutely so rapport with patients it's never wasted you know that time that you spend talking to a patient, the, um, you know, the, the idle chit chat. All of it is helping you build up a, uh, a pool of goodwill. I, I have heard people talk about the goodwill buckets that every time you do some successful treatment or you have a, a good appointment with a patient, you're putting some goodwill into the bucket. And then if something goes wrong, if you have an adverse event, it's like putting a hole in the bottom and some of it drains out. And at the point that that goodwill bucket is empty, that's the point a patient complains or goes to see the dental council. Mm-hmm. And indeed, when that bucket is full, your reputation is very much protected and patients do spread word, word of mouth, um, which in many situations can be more effective than a, in my opinion, a Google review or a published advert, you know, patient's perception, family taken care of that goodwill can be valuable in just ensuring that the practice is successful indeed i I mean the the old adage treat a patient as you would like to be treated yourself Mm -hmm. i mean that sets you up well you know patients recognize that and patients are very quick to pick up if you don't behave like that and that is a a very good way of killing your professional reputation killing your practice Mm -hmm. treat people properly so moving on towards the sort of family aspects of the care, I mentioned before about wisdom teeth, uh, orthodontics, etc. So in, in terms of wisdom teeth, we've got to obviously monitor, monitor the development or the decay that may arise. And we do see some cases arising from that area, don't we? Uh, we do. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm in the lucky position that I've been in the practice for just over 25 years. And so... For a couple of families, I've seen four generations and I've seen people um, arrive pregnant and then I've seen that child, you know, some of those are 23, 24 now. Um, So I've watched them develop and by sensible assessments, appropriate radiographs um, and having a look at, you know, what can I see of that wisdom tooth? If you are forewarning your patients that there might be issues with their their wisdom teeth, then you're far less likely to have issues when they're when situations arise patients rarely do anything off their own bat about wisdom teeth but the moment they get pain with them they're banging on the door to come and see you and indeed included the with the progression development of the patient we've got the orthodontic assessments and ensuring that we cover all aspects i mean the cases that we tend to see in those the perhaps the most significant ones tend to be missing buried canines practitioners perhaps not keeping an eye on those yeah so um trying to ensure that your charting is always up to date so that you know which teeth are present um we occasionally see 
uh, the wrong extraction of um, of teeth where people take out a permanent premolar instead of one of the deciduous molars. So meticulous charting is, is really important. And then the discussions that lead up to the point at which you are considering either providing orthodontic treatment yourself or referring for orthodontic treatment. You know, it's helpful that you've brought the family on that journey that, you know, it'll be a couple of years and we'll be thinking of doing this because I can see the following issues with your child's um, occlusion. Mm. And indeed, when we are obtaining opinions, perhaps referring to an orthodontist or even referring for anything, we see cases arising from the omission of the letter actually going. And who is at fault? Uh, We do indeed. We've now got a system in place in our practice whereby if a referral letter is acquired, um, we can create a task for that patient and the nurses are empowered to do that and expected to do that. And at the end of every day, um, we go to our task list and have a look at what referral letters need doing and get them done. And then we keep a spreadsheet of the names of the patients, the date it was sent, and then that's ticked off when it's been acknowledged by our uh, local orthodontists who provide the treatment. Mm. And that that avoids that hard to sink moment where a a parent rings back and says, I haven't heard from the orthodontist yet, and you realise it hasn't gone? I had a heart sink one um, about four weeks ago. A patient came in. I haven't heard anything from the orthodontist yet, and I had a look on my system, and I hadn't done the letter. And at that point, transparency is key. You know, you apologise to the patient, you apologise to the parent and say, look, I haven't done it yet. My apologies for it. But if patients find out afterwards that you have hidden from them, that they, you haven't done the, the referral, then that becomes much more difficult to explain in the event that it goes to the regulator. And indeed, and if a dental council sees evidence that we've either misled or been less than honest with our patients, those are the types of cases that bring on the sanctions rather than the omission in the first place. So I entirely agree in terms of that. Yeah. So dental councils take a very dim view of dishonesty and it can be very hard to keep your registration with the dental council if you have been dishonest with the patient or their parents. Indeed. Indeed. And when we are seeing patients referred back to us from an orthodontist often there can be some issues and some cases arising over a misunderstanding of the request of the orthodontist particularly for extractions yeah we've seen lots of those in the era of handwritten letters in particular uh, confusion over c's and e's was very common um, because they look so similar Um, and if there's any doubt we phone up the um, the orthodontist you know if, if you're going to be doing something irreversible You need to make sure you're absolutely certain which teeth you're taking out. And what about the situation where the treatment plan from the orthodontist seems inappropriate by yourself? How would you manage that situation? So the first thing is that you try and make sure that you don't overtly criticise your colleague. And you might say to the patient and their parents, I'm not quite sure whether this is what they intended. So I think we ought to delay the extractions until we've clarified with the orthodontist exactly um, which teeth it is they are wanting me to extract. And ultimately, if you think that uh, treatment plan is wrong and you proceeded to extract the teeth knowing that, then you might be criticised by the dental council. So Mm. there are occasions where you might decline to do treatment. that you vehemently disagreed with. Okay. And then looking at the, you know, what are the influences and distractions that can divert the clinician from a comprehensive approach? We're talking about uh, across the board here. There's there's perhaps uh, an approach to break it down into sections of, of systemic issues, patient issues, and the clinician issues. What sort of systemic influences and distractions do we see? So the the kind of the the overall system we work in can influence how long you book for certain appointments. And if the remuneration for something is low, the temptation is to not have enough time to do an adequate assessment. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's obviously harks back to our basic professional values. 
Um, so we need to make sure that we put our patient's interest first. And ultimately, if you're rushing something because of, of setting up your, your appointment book to kind of compensate for that, then you are likely to get yourself into trouble. And in terms of uh, patients themselves, some, some patients display behaviours and mannerisms which can, can influence us and distract us. Yeah, um, so we've all had patients who wait until the end of the checkup and you finish their scale and polish as well to tell you about the problem that they that you asked about at the start and they said there was nothing. And then you've got to, you know you've got no time left. You've got a patient waiting in, in the waiting room, and they're, you're expected to assess, diagnose, and treat their toothache. We've all had patients who seem to be able to talk the whole of the length of the appointment. And that, that can take an age for some patients to get in the chair. And then we've got patients who've got health issues that make communication more challenging. Something as simple as deafness that can make getting a timely history very challenging to do. And there are issues perhaps with patients' compliance and perhaps then also considering the patient who tries to push us to provide treatment that we might not otherwise do. You've seen many patients try? Uh, Yes. So there are patients who, particularly in the era of Dr. Google, who seem to think that they know what is best for their their teeth, or they've read around and they've heard about this new craze. So um, we've had patients wanting ozone therapy for huge cavities. So the, the challenge is to try and convince a patient that what they are seeking is not in their best interests. And, and if that is your view, then every dental counsellor has ethical guidelines that you should be acting in the best interest of the patient. So ultimately, occasionally I refuse to do some treatments. Yeah, and I think for, for younger colleagues, if you've got a bullying patient, just to be aware that if you get coerced into providing the treatment they demand that may not be appropriate, it may well come back to bite because ultimately we're the professional with the knowledge and maybe Jim would you say for a younger colleague if a patient is pushing them down a route then getting a senior colleague in to just have a second opinion can often just help diffuse the situation and it can indeed if you've got a senior colleague in the practice that can be really helpful or potentially you might refer to a specialist in that area of dentistry or to a, a a local, more experienced colleague that you've got an appropriate relationship with. And then in terms of the clinician, there are some potential influences and distractions, um, such as, as, I mean, health is a common issue, isn't it, Jim? We see dental legal matters arising from those who are suffering from health issues. We do. Um, those can be very difficult to unpick sometimes. Um, fortunately, most dental councils as well as running kind of disciplinary and fitness to practice um, panels, will often process those down a a health route. So we often see stress can be a big factor. It can lead to poor decisions, particularly if that stress is related to um, finances. Mm -hmm. uh, People who are struggling financially are more likely to be tempted to do more expensive treatment plans. And we may see the reduction in record keeping, um, accuracy of records, accuracy of conversations with patients, if a stress, if there is significant stress on the individual and, you know, perhaps a potentially approaching burnout. And obviously we've got information on that. We've also got counselling service for anyone that has a real concern about their well-being, which is confidential in it and managed in each country. And just one simple mnemonic halt. We are at most risk of a dental legal issue arising when we are hungry, angry, late and tired. And I'm certainly aware in in Asia, uh, a lot of people doing two to three sessions most of the days of the week. And if certainly you're doing three sessions, six days a week, that to me, for some individuals, not everyone, but for perhaps the majority might be a a route to burnout. And and sort of, I think a a work-life balance is important, but everyone is different. Just want to highlight that. And then, Jim, in terms of the clinician, we all like toys, don't we? We all like to have a new toy, and can that be a, a problem? It can, particularly if you've got a, uh, a new large debt to service. Um, you know, something as simple as a, a new cone beam CT machine. All of a sudden, there is a, 
almost a financial necessity is one way of thinking about it, which is probably not a healthy way of thinking about it, to service that debt by doing enough per day to pay off the, the finance agreement. And we have seen it in clinics that have got new CEREC machines, so CAD CAM production of indirect restorations. All of a sudden, some patients seem to get a large number of units of CEREC. So yes, that, that can lead you off the straight and narrow of, of a, an optimised treatment plan for that patient. Yeah, indeed. Well, thanks, Jim. Just by way of summary, then, what we're, what we're talking about, to, to minimise the risk, we seem to be looking to ensure that uh, systems and processes are robust. So we're talking about a checklist approach where appropriate. We're talking about empowering staff to support you in the practice. Ultimately, if there is a dental council complaint, we can't deflect it to the staff. It is we're going to fall to ourselves. So ensuring the staff are empowered, but also ensure good good governance, would you agree, Jim? And then thirdly, the most important leg is is we ensure that the records are comprehensive and contain the information we would wish to be in there should there ever be a challenge from either a claimant or a dental council. So uh, rapport building, you know, being on good terms with your patient and having uh, goodwill in the bucket, having your staff empowered that if, if they see something that's potentially going to cause an issue, that they are positively encouraged to speak up the records that your staff keep are also really important. So, yeah, the, the record keeping, ultimately, you have the responsibility as the, the dentist to check that that is correct. But particularly in the days of computerised records, they can probably do 90 to 95 percent of that record keeping for you with a few button presses and the odd change of a few words. Yes, I, I agree. I think I very much totally agree. If you've got a very good nurse. They are incredibly supportive. They can be such a benefit to safe practice, to happy patients, and to the journey of the patient being one that they're happy to spread to others and be positive. So we we have covered a, uh, a fair bit there. We hope there's some areas, a lot of it is just reflecting what the common sense of day-to-day -day practice is. But in, in looking at this, it just hopefully puts it back on our radar and we can be conscious about how we provide the routine care and minimize the risks. So thank you, Jim, and thanks for listening to this Dental Protection Podcast. If you'd like any further information about the topics covered today or about the speakers, please have a look in the podcast description. If you would like a CPD certificate for listening today, please also look in the description for a link. I've been your host, James Foster, and thank you for listening. <laughs>